afternoon and uh, welcome to this discussion of chapter 28 out of your textbook. Uh, this chapter are, is for our advanced students, uh, the ones that are, are viewing this film are in Weld 2520, uh, Schedule 80 Pipe, and there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, I'm on page 1007 in your textbook, Joint Design, Testing, and Inspection. And I put this here because most of the industry in, in our area, if, if you go to take a test for them, this is the test they're going to give you, 6-inch Schedule 80 pipe. So at this point in your careers, in your training, you should understand uh, something about joint design, testing, and the way it's inspected. Some of the stuff you're already going to know, so it'll be a bit of a review. And that part I'm probably going to go through rather headlong. Uh, but some of this is going to be new to you. As we go through here, there will be certain pages in, that I'm going to want you to highlight, and I'll try to give you a heads up on, on what I think is the important aspects of this chapter, and I'll ask you to put a little bullet by it and so forth. So stay with me. I'm going to move kind of fast because I want to get done in an hour, so we'll, we'll see how well we do this. So starting on page 1007, go to the second paragraph and hi highlight the remainder of that column. And I've got a couple of bullets there. And the first bullet comes at the very beginning where it says, for a long time it had been considered necessary only to look at a completed weld in order to judge its quality and the welder's ability. If carried out by a competent inspector and or welder, visual inspection may be satisfactory for welds that are designed primarily to hold parts together and that are not subject to high stress in service. Uh, this kind of inspection is limited since there is no way of knowing if the weld metal has internal defects. The outer appearance of the weld may be entirely satisfactory, and yet it may be porous, contain cracks, and lack both complete fusion and penetration. The weld metal may have serious defects due to poor welding technique. So visual inspection, uh, it's not satisfactory for, for critical welds. And it's not uncommon at all for a welder to take a qualification test, and what they'll do is they'll x-ray it first to look at the internal structure. They'll be looking for slag inclusions, uh, porosity, um, things of that nature, and then they'll go ahead and do their destructive test. That is, they'll do their, their face and root bins on it. There's a bullet here on this uh, next paragraph. that says, critical welding demands that the weld metal and the joint be tested for strength, soundness, and other physical qualities required in the design. The reliability of the welded joint can be determined by the degree to which the metal is kept free of four materials such as slag, gas pockets, cracks, and by the degree to which it is fused to the base metal. Okay, joint design. Now there are five types of joints and I put a little uh, slide up here on the board. We're going to discuss these five types. We probably mentioned these before, but uh, not in any great depth. So you can see in, in parentheses they have, they have butt, corner, T-joint, lap joint, and edge joint. And these come out of AWS publication A3.0. And these are all there are. There's only five types. No matter how you fit them together, there's only five basic types of joints. Now, you can make a lot of different welds from those five basic types of joints. So here, this is a bullet. You need to remember that there are five types of joints and you should memorize what five types of joints there are because you're going to have one or more questions uh, referring to that. Now your book in the next topic talks about open and closed roots. Well, their closed root is simply, simply shoving these things together. Um, and if you look at figure 28.1, they've just butted them up so that there's no root opening. AWS recognizes a backing strip uh, and an open root. It, welding pipe, the class you're in now, we, we use an open root. Uh, you can use what's called a chill ring and you'll still have a little bit of a gap but you'll have a backing ring that you'll weld and it will, it will tie into the uh, sides of your, of your pipe. Um, if you have a closed root like your book is talking about, it would require back welding. You'd have to back gouge it or back grind it and then back weld it. Um, this is the first time I've ever heard of anything called a closed root. That's a new, that's a new term to me. So uh, from here, let's read from the second paragraph, and this is a bullet, the term penetration 
refers to the depth to which the base metal is melted and fused with the metal of the filler rod or electrode. So that's the, the, the depth of fusion uh, into the parent metal. From that same paragraph it reads, whether a certain type of joint should be set up as an open or a closed root depends upon the following factors. How thick it is, the kind of joint it is, the nature of the job, the position of the welding, the type and size of the electrode, the structural importance of the joint, and the physical properties required of the weld. So all of those things that w the engineer would take into consideration. Now let's look at the first one that they're talking about, the edge joint. Uh, this is a slide of what an edge joint would look like, and here all they've done is they've taken two pieces of metal and butt them together, and their definition is a joint between the edges of two or more parallel or nearly parallel members. And these are the types of welds that are applicable to those. So you can have a, fit, uh, a bevel groove, a flare bevel groove, a flare V groove, a J groove, a square groove, a U groove, a V groove, an edge, or a seam. If figure 28-2 shows us an edge and a flare bevel groove. The one on the right-hand side, you can see how it's curved slightly, and that would be a flare bevel because only one side is flared. Then we have a butt joint. The pipe that you're welding, those are butt joints, and uh, we use a single V groove on that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Its definition, uh, according to AWS, is a joint between two members aligned approximately in the same plane. Now these are the al applicable joints for that, and there's a number of them. A bevel groove, let me just show you here. If we have a bevel groove, the first one here, that means one member is going to be square and the other member is going to have a bevel on it. So this is a bevel groove. Our next one is a flare bevel, and I'm afraid I don't have a, I don't have a piece of rounded stock, but it would be, one member would be rounded and the other one would be square. Then we have a flare V, and a flare V, both members would be rounded like so. And this would be a flare V. Um, a, a J groove, this kind of a groove, you'd actually machine this, although it can be done with, with a, an air carbon arc. You could, you could put a J shape on one member and then the other member is going to be square. So this would be a, a J groove. Then we have a square groove. And this would be used on thin metal. You would take not, it, usually you don't weld anything greater than a, a quarter of an inch thick with a square groove. That's where you don't have any pre edge preparation at all. You just bring the two members together and weld it from one side or both sides. So that would be your square groove. A U groove is nothing more than two J's put together, forming a U. And then we have a V groove, which is what you're doing with your with your uh, pipe right now, what we're doing is we're using two bevels, putting them together to form a V. This is called a single V groove. Um, and then next we have the edge flange, and that would be similar to this, but it would be like so, with one member square. And then we have uh, brazing welding which is an entirely different field. You get into dip brazing, furnace brazing, and so forth. Um, before I get onto this, take a look at your book. And uh, on page 109, uh, 1010, you can see here that they talk about open square groove butt joints, single V groove butt joints. Under single V groove butt joint, I've highlighted the last portion of the first paragraph, which reads, the single V groove type is ordinarily used on plate thicknesses ranging from one quarter of an inch to five eighths of an inch thick. If welding is to be done from one side only, full penetration to the root of the weld must be obtained. Failure to do so will cause a fracture if the joint is subjected to severe loading. So with a single V groove, typically you're not going to weld it any greater than 5 eighths of an inch thick, and you have to get full, complete penetration without any undercut or lack of penetration uh, on that. Thicker than that, you're going to use a different joint design. 
On the next one where it says double V groove butt joint, I highlighted this first sentence which reads, the double V groove butt joint is suitable for most severe load conditions. It is used on heavier plate than single V groove butt joints, uh, usually one quarter of an inch to one and a half inches. Now the thing about a double V groove, if you have a double V groove like this, and you have to weld this up, as the welder you want to avoid distortion. So you're going to weld this side here first and then grind it out completely to clean white metal, then you're going to white, put a bead in there and then a second bead in there. Then you're going to come back around here, put a second bead in there and then maybe a third bead. Then you're going to come over here and put maybe your third bead and your fourth bead. And then you're going to come back here and put your fourth bead. So you're going to alternate sides in order to control the heat input into the weldment and to control distortion to the maximum. So this is used for about up to about one and a half inch thick stuff. There's, a, there's what they call a compound bevel too, which they'll use on thicker stuff, but that's something else again. So let's go to the next one on page 1011 where it says beveled groove butt welds. I've highlighted right under that title where it says single bevel groove butt joints, figures 28, 8, and 28, 9, and double bevel groove butt joints are used in some areas. Uh, then I skipped a, skipped a sentence and highlighted, they join metal up to three quarters of an inch thick uh, and less filler metal is required than for V-groove butt joints, thus reducing the number of electrodes. You have to always remember that in addition to service conditions and, and the metal thickness, they want to do it as quickly as they possibly can. And so they can use compound bevels or a single bevel. Uh, so there's not as much welding involved. Uh, if they, the more welding you do, the wider the joint is, the more stresses you're going to build up, the, the, the more problems you're going to have with, uh, with distortion and residual stress in the weldment. Then you have single U butt joint. The single U groove joints are used for very important work such as fired and non-fired pressure vessels. Uh, and th those thicknesses will be about a half an inch to a quarter of an inch. A double U groove on the next page, and they, they're putting pictures of these up here for us. Here's a double U. Double U groove joints are used on work of the same nature as single U groove joints but when plate thicknesses are greater and welding can be done from both sides. Plate thickness ranges up to three quarters of an inch. Although the cost of preparation is greater than for the single U groove butt joints, double joints may be welded with fewer electrodes. Welding from both sides permits a more even distribution of stress and reduces distortion. Then it goes on and talks about J groove butt joints. So read about that. Uh, and then we finally come to lap joints, which is our next slide. This is a lap joint and as you can tell all, all, one member simply overlaps the next and it's a joint the definition is a joint between two overlapping members in parallel planes. Now remember these definitions are standard terms put out by the American Welding Society in, in their standard A3.0 so we're going to use standard terms all through here. Um, these are some of the joints that are applic applicable to lap joints. Uh, plug joints, slot joints, spot joints. In spot joints, you can imagine that 16 gauge metal that we use in the welding lab. If you put one piece on top of another and took a MIG and used a special tip, you could pull the trigger and it would be hot enough to, to melt through that upper plate and fuse into the bottom plate and without any preparation at all. It will simply burn through it. And, uh, and weld the two together, and so those are called spot welds. We'll get into welds later. Corner joint, this definition is a joint between two members located approximately at right angles to each other in the form of an L. And these are some of the joints that are applicable to that. Fillet, bevel groove, flare, bevel groove, so forth and so on. And let me see. If you look at figure 2817, down in the lower right hand corner of page 1013, they show us three different types of, of corner joints here. And the first one looks like this. And they've, they've tried to get full penetration in it like so. And that would be just a butt joint on a corner. And then half open corner goes like this. And 
This then would be a fillet weld because they've, they've got this budding member here. And then this one, if you look at the joint configuration, it actually forms a V. So this, even though it's a corner joint, this could be construed as a single V groove as well. Uh, we got into a big discussion uh, over this in, at a seminar I went to in San Diego and uh, this is what we came up with. Same thing in your book, but we're just using uh, different terminology. Your book calls this last one a full open corner joint and uh, the experts decided that was still going to be a single V groove. Even though it is, it's a corner, the weld, the shape of the weld is still similar to a single V groove. Then we have a T joint. Uh, a joint between two members located at approximately right angles from each other forming a T. And then we have a fillet weld, bevel groove weld. All of these can be, all these welds can be associated with that. And if you'll turn the page, you'll see a bunch of these. Uh, upper left hand corner is a T joint and, the, and, and that has a fillet weld in it. And then we have a double fillet under B. And uh, then figure 2820 actually gets to where we have have a double bevel like this. And so you've got a bevel here and a bevel there. So this, this edge preparation then gives you a double bevel uh, and so forth. A over on, on 2819, that's a single bevel. Uh, both of the, uh, the B is a single bevel with a back weld on it. And then figure 2821 is a single J. And it all goes back to the edge preparation. How is it prepared? Okay. Let's see. Okay. That's all on that. Now we're talking about code welding. And here, this is the definition of a code. I don't think you'll find that in your book, so you may want to write it down in your notes. A code is defined as a body of laws, as of a nation, city, etc., arranged systematically for easy reference. It has legal status. Codes have legal status. There are people that have been taken into court for code violations, so remember that. Um, under the heading codes, Go to about the middle of that first paragraph and highlight and put a bullet by where it says a universal testing procedure for all types of welding in all locations does not exist. There's no such thing as a welding test that you can take and it's going to be good for anything, anywhere. It does not exist. Codes have legal status. You'll find words such as shall and will. Codes are mandatory. You have to comply with codes. And then the methods, there, there are methods that have to determine, are used to determine that you are complying with codes. These are some organizations that produce codes. The, the ones we're going to be interested in are these top three, AWS, ASME, and API. Although uh, a lot of stuff is done under DOT, but these are the three main ones right here. So read in your, reading your text here and know what these, these three are. You're gonna, you may get a question similar to, uh, tell me about ASME code section 9, okay? Yeah, or tell me about API standard 1104, so read about those. Or AWS structural welding code D1.1, you should know those terms, you should know those codes. That doesn't mean I, uh, I expect you to memorize those codes, but simply know what they reference. Um, for example, ASME section 9, boiler and pressure vessel code. Okay, that's for, for like power plants and the piping industry. Um, AWS, D1.1, over here on the end, structural welding code for steel. Or API 1104, oil refineries. So you may get a question asking you, which one of those three codes would you use to build a skyscraper? Well, it's going to be AWS D1.1. So you may get a question like that. Um, drop down to the second of the, of the last paragraph on page 1015. 
second column, where it says, the welder does not have to be thoroughly informed about the details of all the existing codes. The employer, through the engineering and production departments, makes sure that the work meets the standards required for it. The welder should, however, have a good understanding of the different weld codes or t weld tests and know what to look for in any visual uh, inspection. Qualification is the, is the fabricator's responsibility. It's not yours. Whoever you work for, they should have qualified welding procedures, qualified welders, qualified welding operators, and qualified tack welders. It's their job to take care of that. They're supposed to produce the documentation that you work from. Procedure qualification. There are two broad categories of welding tests. A procedure qualification test is a test conducted for the purpose of determining the correctness of the method of welding for a specific welding project. The American Welding Society and various code authorities have established standard procedures for welding. The welding procedure meets specifications for base metal, uh, joint preparation, position of welding, the welding processes, uh, welding techniques, and so forth. So procedure qualification testing, all of these that we've talked about, ASME, API, AWS, they all have to, they all put those forth. They cover welding and brazing. A procedure qualification defines the essential welding variables, and that is your position, the joint preparation, the position of welding, and that's the type of west, uh, testing that's required to, sh to prove that, it, that whatever weld you're making is going to have the, the necessary mechanical properties. So a procedure qualification determines the compatibility of the base metals, the filler metals, the type of process that you're using, and the techniques employed. Welding variables. Now when you're welding, you, you have to understand that because there is no universal uh, welding test, there isn't one because there's so many variables. Uh, one day you may be welding on that big high-rise building in, in, in Las Vegas. The next day you may be in Alaska repairing an oil pipeline. The two are not compatible. You have to have a different, different variables apply to each one. And some of these variables are welding position, joint configuration, the type of electrode and size, the base metal type and its thickness, the welding techniques employed, and the use of a backing or, no, or, or not having a backing. So, uh, and this is mentioned here, it says such requirements as current setting, electrode size, electrode manipulation and preheat, interpass and post heat temperatures are, are specified. Uh, following a particular procedure assures uniform results. Tests that certify welders for code work may be known as welder qualification tests or performance qualification tests. So this is our second type of uh, of tests. These are essential variables. These are the things that your procedure will address. And then you have your welder qualification. You have to do the procedure before you do the welder qualification. The procedure gives the instructions to the welder. So what does a welder qualification do? It determines if an individual welder has sufficient skill to produce satisfactory welds using a qualified procedure. That's what that happens there. Um, then reading from your book uh, on page 1016, go to the next column and highlight, highlight where it says, reliability of welding is based on the use of appropriate inspection controls. The methods of testing that determine the quality of a weld are divided into three very broad classifications. Know these, non-destructive testing, destructive testing, and visual inspection. Flip the, flip the page to 1018, highlight where it reads, uh, this method is highly effective, they're talking about visual inspection now, visual inspection is highly effective when applied before, during, and after welding operations by properly trained and skilled welders and inspectors. So when you're performing visual inspection, you're going to do it before, during, and after. The American Welding Society has a certification program, QC1, to certify welding inspectors at three different levels. This certification is for visual inspection only, but additional add-ons are available for other non-destructive and destructive methods. Uh, if those of you that are going for your degree, you will take my class uh, that covers QC1. You'll learn everything that you need to, to know to be a certified welding inspector. What we're covering in this chapter is basically a summary 
of, of those things. Our next topic is non-destructive testing. So non-destructive testing, and you can see in red, it's highlighted NDT. The T is for testing. So what do you think E is for? Non-destructive examination. And these are the big five for non-destructive -ex non examination. In welding, we have the big five welding processes. That is, we have shielded metal arc welding, gas tungsten arc welding, gas metal arc welding, flux core arc welding, and submerged arc welding. Those are the big five welding processes. These are the big five non-destructive examination methods. Dye penetrant, magnetic particle, radiographic, ultrasonic, and eddy current. Big five. And then, of course, visual inspection uh, is, a, is, is a standalone category. So looking on page 1019, let's talk about magnetic particle testing. In, in MT testing, and know these abbreviations, you're going to see them on your test. MT, magnetic particle testing. In this, a flaw oriented transverse to magnetic flux creates poles of opposite signs at edges, very attractive to iron particles. So essentially what we've got is uh, a magnet. We're going to magnetize a piece of base material, and then we're going to sprinkle really fine magnetic particles on there. And if there's any flaw in the material, those magnetic particles, those magnetic particles will be attracted. And this, this is called a bladder. And what it has is it has real fine, and I don't know if you can see that coming out of there or not, but it has real fine magnetic particles. These happen to be gray, but you can get them in gray, black, red, white, and you'll sprinkle that. Say this is a piece of plate, and we'll put a yoke on here or a prod on here or a fixed permanent magnet on there, and we're going to magnetize that base metal, and then we're going to sprinkle this on. And if there's a crack anywhere in there, those magnetic particles are going to be attracted to that crack. And that's essentially how magnetic particle testing works. It's very fast, you can do it in any position, and it's going to reveal surface or slightly subsurface defects. So let's read from your book, right under the title where it says magnetic particle testing, highlight this. Magnetic particle testing is one of the most easily used non-destructive tests. It is used to inspect plate edges before welding for surface imperfection. Uh, it tests welds for such defects as surface cracks, lack of fusion, porosity, undercut, incomplete root penetration, and slag inclusions. Uh, go over to the next column and highlight the paragraph which reads, Magnetic particle testing detects the presence of internal and surface cracks too fine to be seen by the naked eye. Defects can be detected to a depth of one quarter to one eighth of an inch below the surface of the weld. Defects much deeper than this are not likely to be found. Now, this is the first time I've, I've, I've heard that it can detect something as deep as a quarter of an inch. Most sources say about a sixteenth of an inch, so just slightly subsurface. So what are the steps? As I, as I just mentioned, you're going to magnetize the part, you're going to apply iron particles, uh, you're going to evaluate any accumulations, and then you're going to clean the part afterwards if necessary, and then sometimes you may have to demagnetize the part. So, here's, a, here's an example of a permanent magnet. But before I get to this next slide, let me, uh, let's go to page 1020. And in the first column, hi highlight this section which reads, the part is magnetized by using an electric current to set up a magnetic field within the material or by putting the piece in an electric coil. That's two ways of magnetizing it. A permanent magnet is another way. The magnetized surface is covered by a, a thin layer of magnetic powder such as blast resin or red iron oxide. So that's our powder. Go to the next column and highlight it where it reads, if there is a defect, the powder is held to the surface at the defect because the, of the powerful magnetic field in the workpiece sets up a north magnetic pole at one end and the defect and a south magnetic pole at the other. This is referred to as flux leakage. Magnetic flux is leaking out of the crack. These poles have a stronger attraction for the magnetic particles in the surrounding surface material. And so that's why it accumulates there. Then go ahead and flip it uh, to page 1022 
and uh, this is an important thing. The the very uh, the second paragraph reads: cracks must be at an angle to the magnetic lines of force in order to show. Okay, so what we've got here, and they've got a number of pictures of it. If we have a if we have a plate, and there's a crack right here, and we put our put a magnet on there like that, and the flux lines are going like this, well, then this crack is pretty much aligned with the way the flux, uh, the, the flux is. So we would have to turn this magnet 180 degrees so that it's like this to the crack, and then that crack is going to show up. So you have to be very careful. Uh, typically, you, do a, you, you test something in two directions. You'll, you'll take what's called a yoke or, or a permanent magnet and you'll put it down like so on a piece and you'll put your powder on there. If you don't see anything, then you're going to take that magnet and you're going to turn it 90 degrees and put it down there again and check it one more time so that you can, you'll be certain that you haven't aligned, uh, aligned it, uh, aligned those magnetic forces with the crack because it may not show up otherwise. So, figure tw uh, 2832 shows a, a magnet talks about magnetic fluxes here. Here we have a nice example of, of a permanent magnet with a north-south pole and here we have the, the, the crack or discontinuity as it's called and it sets up an, op, uh, an opposing north-south pole. Uh, you, you have this picture in your text, it's, uh, figure 2830. This is called a prod. This is a power supply and it'll put a lot of uh, amperage through this creating a, a much stronger magnetic field than you could with a permanent magnet. Uh, this is called a yoke. These are very portable. They plug into 110. We have one of these here on campus and those of you that end up taking QC1, my inspection class, you get an opportunity to use one of these. Uh, and we'll inspect some stuff and we'll look for flaws. And then here, this is longitudinal magnetism. And this is figure 20, 2834 in your text. And what they've done here is they, they put, put this part inside a coil so that they've magnetized the entire thing by putting it inside this coil. And here you see a, a crack and a crack and a crack. And they put them at different orientations for us. And uh, it says cracks at 45 degrees will show. Uh, cracks parallel to the lines of force will not show and then cracks at 90 degrees will show. So this is again a reason why we have to do it in two directions. Advantages of magnetic particle testing. It's fast, it's very sensitive, doesn't cost much, portable, and I would add it's easy to learn. Limitations. You have to be able to magnetize the part. So it's not going to work on aluminum. Uh, it doesn't work very well if there's a thick coating on whatever it is you're trying to, to inspect. It's limited to surface or near surface discontinuities. So I would take exception with your book when it says that you can find something up to a quarter of an inch deep. I suppose you could if you were using the prod technique where you're really putting a lot of magnetism into it, but typically if you're using a yoke, uh, not more than about a sixteenth of an inch deep. And you may have to demagnetize whatever it is that you're testing. So, know about that. Know especially that you have to magnetize something. Know you have to go to 90 degrees to the defect in order to detect it. Know that it's going to be surface or near surface. Um, and know the initials. And that's pretty much it on that one. Radiographic testing, RT. Based on the principle of preferential radiation transmission or absorption. That's a mouthful. But again, these are A3.0 definitions. Reading from your textbook, I've highlighted this entire section right under uh, radiographic inspection. It says Radiograph uh, radiography is a non destructive test method that shows the presence and type of microscopic defects in the interior of welds. The method utilizes either the X ray or gamma ray. The source of x-rays is the x-ray tube. Well, first of all, here we have uh, radiation types. As your book says, there's two types, gamma radiation and x-rays. X-rays come from a machine. Gamma radiation comes from iridium. 
uh, 192, cobalt 60, and cesium 137. I've worked with both of these. Uh, this has a half-life of, I believe it's 52 days. This one has a much longer half-life and is much more powerful than iridium, but it's also, uh, you have to take special precautions with it because it is more powerful. Whereas with iridium, you may have to evacuate an area uh, of 200 feet uh, around where you're, you're testing. With cobalt 60, you're going to have to evacuate 200 yards around where you, maybe even more, because it's so much more powerful. You use cobalt 60 for really thick stuff. Use iridium for most pipe. The type of pipe you're doing right now, you could use iridium for in a heartbeat. X-ray is better though. Oops. We're going in the wrong direction here. And I'm hitting reverse. Well, I don't know what happened, but uh, I have to hit forward to go in reverse here now. <laughs> okay, here's what I wanted to get to. This is an x-ray machine, and this is just like our x-ray machine. If you go into our x-ray room and open up that lead line chamber, you'll see a tube very similar to this. Your x-rays come out of here. Uh, what happens is they, they energize this tube and then the uh, electrons are, are knocked off of there and they hit a tungsten target. And they, they, the target set at 45 degrees to the gun, to the cathode, and it shoots them out and penetrates your, uh, your uh, whatever object it is you're going to try to x-ray. So let me finish reading here. It says, uh, gamma rays are produced by the atomic disintegration of radium or one of the several commercially available isot radioisotopes. While gamma rays, because of their short wavelengths, can penetrate a considerable thickness of material, exposure time is much longer than for X-rays. The film produced by X-rays or gamma rays are referred to as radiographs. So the film is, is called a radiograph. Um, one thing about exposure times, these sources, as I said, like iridium has a, has a half-life of 52 days. Well, you have to know how fresh the source is that you're using when you're working in the field. If it's an, an older source and, 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 and it's been out there for 72 days, well, now you're going to have to expose it much longer to whatever it is you want to x-ray in order to get, get the image that you desire, the quality of the image that you desire. Um, radiation absorption, go to the next column in the third sentence and highlight and pick this up where it says different materials absorb radiation at different rates. Since slag absorbs less radiation than steel, the presence of slag permits more radiation to reach the film. Thus, the area of the slag inclusion shows up darker than the steel on the film. And this indicates a discontinuity in the weld metal. A radiograph can establish the presence of a variety of defects and record their size, shape, and relative locations. So, the thicker or higher density the materials absorb more radiation, resulting in less transmission to the film. Let me make that perfectly clear for you because you need to know if I had a, a block of steel, and in fact they call this a, a step gauge, and it might be two inches thick here and only a quarter of an inch thick here, and I put film underneath that and I shot it, I x-rayed it, and we're looking at our film now. Um, here it's going to be very, very white because it had to go through all that steel and not many x-rays got through. But here it's going to be very, very dark because that's only a quarter of an inch thick and more x-rays went through exposing the film. So wherever it's thinner, it's going to be darker. Wherever it's thicker, it's going to be lighter. And then the material makes a difference too. If I had a piece of material, the same thickness, but this end was lead and this end was aluminum, aluminum is not nearly as dense as lead, so lead is going to stop much more, many more x-rays than the aluminum will. And so once more, this end where the aluminum is would be very dark and this end would be very light. So it's thickness and density. Those are two things that will make that determination. If you've seen x-rays of tungsten, a tungsten inclusion, for example, in, uh, on an x-ray film, that's going to be very white because tungsten is uh, very dense. Okay.
Let's see, I think that's all. Oh, the steps. How do you do it? Well, you're going to position your source, or you're, either you're going to position your source in relation to what it is you want to shoot, or you're going to position the piece beneath your X-ray tube. Then you're going to put the film behind the object, expose the radiation, develop the film, and then evaluate it. And a nice thing about the film is it's a permanent record. Uh, and you can keep that on file to show what defect there was and how you removed it because you'll x-ray it again after a repair. Orientation of the source, the plate, and the film. They have some examples of this on page 1025. Uh, here they put the source directly above a, a single v-groove and they've x-rayed it and it's passing through here. And you notice here how it's, how it's spreading out. This is called blow-up. So it'll actually look, on the film, it'll look bigger over here than it actually is because the rays are moving at an, at an angle. It's like, it's like if you were out on a basketball court and the sun was at 45 degrees, you're going to cast a shadow that's much larger than you, than you really are. It'll do the same thing with, with this. So you have to have your source oriented correctly. And one of the, one of the problems, and this is, this is a pretty neat thing that they bring out in, in 2838, lower right-hand corner, you have to have your source oriented properly in order to pick up a uh, lack of fusion, for example. Uh, because uh, if, if your source is not set in, say, over here, and the rays are shooting down through here, you won't know that there's a line there. Because if, it's like trying to x-ray a sandwich. If you lay a sandwich flat on the table and shoot through there, it's going to look solid. But if you turn that sandwich up on the side and shoot through there, now you're going to see that there's lines in it. So your source orientation is very important. Advantages. Detects subsurface flaws. It's used for all materials. The film is a permanent record, and you have to store that film properly. Limitations. There's a radiation hazard. So you have to safety first. It requires access to both sides in order to x-ray something. Uh, the flaw orientation may be in, in, in question uh, because of the, the, the source, the orientation of the source. Uh, the types of flaws it can detect are, is limited. It'll detect most, but it has a hard time detecting lack of fusion. And then you have to be able to interpret the film. So you have to be trained to properly read film. Okay, PT testing. I'm going to pick up the pace here just a little bit. Um, real briefly, let me show you. PT, dye penetrant or penetrant testing. Essentially what you're going to do is you're going to take a cleaner, this is a spray cleaner, and you're going to spray it on the part and you're going to clean that up nice and spiffy and then you're going to take a red dye. You're going to take a red dye and you're going to spray that red, red dye on your part and you're going to wait for a while. Now here's a term I want you to write down because I didn't find it in your book. Dwell time. Dwell time is the length of time that you wait for that red dye to be absorbed into any cracks or porosity or anything like that dwell time. So you're going to spray that on there and after a while you're going to take you're going to take your cleaner again and you're going to spray that on a rag and then you're going to clean your part. You're going to wipe it in one direction only and do not spray your cleaner on the part because you'll wash all that dye out of any defects that you, that you find. Once you clean the part then you take a uh, it's called a developer and this is a it's a talcum powder that's suspended in, in like a linseed oil, a very fine oil and you spray this on there and it's white and you spray that on there and and it will draw out any of that red dye that's been absorbed into cracks and things and that's essentially how it's done it's fast it's easy um, and it's very common it's probably next to visual inspection it is probably the most common type of inspection now let's go through a series of slides for this there's two types, and your book talks about both. There's the visible dye and there's fluorescent dye. Fluorescent dye is going to be looked at under a black light. You're going to clean the surface of the part to be inspected. You're going to apply a dye penetrant, that's your red dye. Then you're going to spray your cleaner on a rag, and you're going to wipe, it, wipe the penetrant off your part, but you're only going to wipe it in one direction. Don't scrub it. Then you're going to apply a white developer and let it set for a while. And then it will draw out any remaining red dye. Here it's, uh, here's a little crack and here's some porosity. 
Here's another crack. Here's a toe crack. You may not have been able to see those defects with the naked eye, but that talcum powder will draw out any, any uh, dye that's left and it will become visible for you. So that's how dye penetrant works. Advantages, relatively simple. You can use it on all types of, of metals. It's very sensitive and it's very portable. Limitations, it's somewhat slow, limited to surface discontinuities only, and it requires smooth surfaces. Okay, that's PT. So let's skip over to page 1028 and talk about ultrasonic inspection. Again, this is, would be abbreviated UT for ultrasonic testing. It is based on the propagation of sound waves through materials and the reflected echo from density changes, just like your fish finder. You're going to send a signal through the material. It's going to strike an object and come back. It uses a piezoelectric effect. And that is, let's see, let's go to your book. Highlight, first of all, the paragraph right underneath ultrasonic testing. Uh, ultrasonic inspection is rapid and has the ability to probe deeply without damage in the weldment, up to 200 inches. Because it can be closely controlled, it is able to uh, supply precise information without elaborate test setup. It can detect, locate, and measure both surface and subsurface defects in the weld or the base metal. Okay, so that's what it is. Then drop down to the very last paragraph in that column and highlight where it says, and, and, and this is a bullet, the search unit is called a transducer. The transducer contains a piezoelectric device that converts electric energy into mechanical energy, that is, into sound. And then it converts the mechanical en energy back into an electrical signal. Uh, this electric signal can be displayed on the older cathode ray tubes or the newer liquid crystal displays. The search unit must be closely coupled to the part to be inspected. And this is done with a couplet material. It's kind of a, a greasy, sticky stuff that you, it, kind of like a gel that you put on the part and then you rub, rub your transducer on it. Okay. Continuing reading, it says, when the search unit is applied to the material, two reference bips appear on the screen. The first bip is the echo from the surface contacted, and this is referred to as the main bang, and that is, a, that is a bullet. And the second bip is the echo from the bottom or the opposite surface of the material. The distance between these bips is carefully calibrated, and this pattern indicates that the material is in satisfactory condition. When a defect is picked up by the search unit, it produces a third bip, which registers on the screen between the first and the second. So here we have our main bang, which is the surface of the material. Here's the, here's the, the back end of the material, and in between them, it's picked up a defect. And here's a nice, this is similar to uh, figure 2845 in your text. Uh, here's your transducer, and it's got, a, it's got this greasy gel type couplet here so that it's making good contact. It's sending its sound waves all the way down. They're bouncing back, but right here, it's hitting a defect, and that's bouncing back faster. And so they, they're able to detect, detect that. Uh, and this is a picture of, of, a, of a guy using, using one. And the, the nice thing about this is this first thing right here. And make a note of this because, because, again, I didn't find this in your book. It is a truly volumetric test, meaning that using UT, you can locate a defect within three dimensions. Uh, so you know exactly how deep it is, exactly where it is. It's not like x-ray where it can get blown up and, and distorted and, and you might have a hard time finding it. Uh, you'll know exactly where it is using UT. So volumetric, it is a, and know that term, bullet, volumetric. You, have to, you only have to get to one side. It's very accurate. You can go up to 200 inches deep. Critical flaws are found, and the equipment is fully portable. Limitations, takes a highly skilled operator. Needs smooth surfaces, and it, will, it can do it, groove welds over a quarter of an inch thick. So UT, very, very common. They also use it to gauge thicknesses on boiler tubes and pipe and walls of tanks. They can tell how thick things are. Okay, I'm trying to pick this up a little bit because we've got a long way to go, and I'm told that we're almost at an hour already. So eddy current testing, abbreviated ET. 
Based on the principle of eddy currents being formed in conductive materials in the presence of an AC coil and changes in those eddy currents by material changes. So I'm going to go a little bit faster now. I want you to highlight the first two paragraphs under eddy current. And this is, a, this is similar to the picture that you have in figure 2850. And here we have a coil, an AC coil, and it's setting up a magnetic field here in this material. And these are your secondary or eddy currents. What do you need? You need a base unit, cathode ray tube or a meter, an AC probe, and calibration standards like a calibration block. The uses. Uh, drop down to the bottom of, of the column on page 1030 and highlight that, that paragraph to the end of the, of the topic. Um, it's used for flaw detection. You can tell how thick a material is. You can tell how thick a coating on a material is. You can tell how hard the, the metal is. And you can tell what kind of a heat treatment. So it's a very versatile thing. And it's, it's set up to be done automatically too. So you can do a lot of material in a very short time. Um, but it's not commonly used out in the field. It's more of, more of a shop type or a manufacturing facility type thing. Advantages, it does not contact uh, the part that you're checking. You don't need a couplant. It's readily automated. In fact, most of it is. And it's applicable to all materials. Limitation, it takes a highly skilled operator. Sometimes it's too sensitive. And, and you can misinterpret the results. Uh, it can only check things to about 3 sixteenths of, of an inch. Calibration standards are required. It requires surface cleanliness. Magnetic materials are more difficult. Okay, let's go to leak tests. I read about leak tests. Um, I don't have any slides on that, so I'm going to go through it pretty quick. I, I, uh, I've seen leak tests before. They have a really nice picture on, on, on the next page, figure 2853, where they deliberately over-pressurized a part uh, until it reached failure. Uh, I've seen pressure vessels uh, pumped up, uh, not, un not, not intentionally, but they got the pressure so high and then they got in a hurry with this one and a plug that they had in a coupling uh, came loose and it shot out of the end of this, this head that they had on a, on a pressure vessel and we're talking about a plug that was about as big around as this. That's two inches or so. And it shot 20 feet across the fabrication shop, went through a corrugated steel wall, and dented an I-beam out on the loading dock. So you've got to be very, very careful about the pressures that you're using. Uh, so read about that. You may have a question or two on leak testing. Uh, and that brings us to hardness testing. There's three types. Highlight this where it says Brunel, Rockwell, Vickers, and Noop. And I say three types even though I mentioned four names because Vickers and Noop are uh, both micro hardness tests. So what do you do to do hardness tests? You have to prepare the surface, make an indentation, measure the indentation, and then, they, and then you use that to determine the hardness. Now I've got a number of bullets here. Under Brunel, highlight Brunel. The Brunel hardness test consists of impressing a hardened steel ball into the metal to be tested at a given pressure for a predetermined time. The diameter of the impression is measured and this indicates a Brunel number. Uh, that's a bullet. That's how that works. Drop down to the last sentence in that column and highlight says the Brunel hardness number, BHN, that's a bullet, you should be able to recognize what that is, can be related to the actual tensile strength of carbon steel. That's another bullet. Simply multiply the BHN number by 500 and this will equal its approximate tensile strength. So you could take something that you didn't know what kind of a material it was, perform a, a Brunel hardness test on it, find out what that number was, multiply it by 500 and that would tell you the approximate tensile strength of the material that you're testing. And if you know the approximate tensile strength that will help you to identify what type of, of, of steel that is. Uh, here's an example of it. Here we have some calipers and they're measuring the diameter of this, uh, of this indention that they've made in this piece of material. And then we go to Rockwell tests. Flip the page. Uh, highlight everything on Rockwell on page 1034. Big thing to remember here is you're going to do two, two uh, uh, pressures. You're going to pressure it twice. Uh, you're going to put on a minor load of 10 kilograms 
and then you're going to put on a full load of 150 kilograms. After the major load is removed, the hardness number is indicated on the dial gauge. The hardness numbers are based on the difference of penetration between the major and minor loads. So that's, that's the crux. That's the, that's the heart of Rockwell testing. Paul Johnson has a Rockwell tester. If you want to see, uh, learn a little bit more about that, you can go and look at his. And then we have micro hardness tests. This is on page 1036. There's two types, as I said. Vickers, and I don't, I don't, have, a, I don't have anything on Vickers, but in your, in your book here, you see the bulleted items in the next column. It says the Vickers method is more commonly used for testing thin materials, measuring the surface of a part, small parts and small areas, measuring individual microstructures, and so forth. And then the NOOP method is commonly used for closely spaced requirements, testing close to an edge due to the narrow shape of, of the indentation, uh, more resolution due to the width of the NOOP indentation, and so forth. Those are both bullets. Know what Vickers and Noops, NOOP is used for, but more importantly, know that it, uh, know the term micro hardness is associated with with that uh, let's see destructive testing folks I've tried to go through this pretty quick but it looks like we're going to be about another 20 minutes destructive testing again AWS definition failing or destroying a part or a portion thereof to determine its properties uh, let's see, let's flip the page to 1038, procedure qualification, and go to 1039 and highlight the paragraph which reads, the welding procedure can be thought of as, as analogous to a chef and the use of a recipe. Once a good recipe is produced, a skilled chef should be able to follow it and produce a consistent dish. If a skilled welder follows the welding procedure specifications, uh, since it's analogous to a recipe, a consistent high quality weldment should be produced. That's the purpose of a procedure qualification test. You set the recipe, the instructions for the welder. Okay. Um, we've already talked about welder qualification test. That's on page 1041. Then we talk about preparation of the test specimen, there is something I want to draw your attention to. On page 1038, look at table 28-9 at the bottom of the, of the page. And it says, typical WPS qualification requirement for complete joint penetration groove welds. Look over in the left-hand column, it says nominal plate thickness tested. It says uh, less than or equal to one-eighth of an inch, less than or equal to three-eighths of an inch. And then, and then below that we have three eighths of an inch uh, to just less than an, to, to one inch. And then you go across and it tells you what kinds of specimens you've got to take. So if we were going to qualify a procedure, say in six inch schedule lady pipe, well that wall thickness is 0.432, just less than a half an inch. So it's more than three eighths, but less than one. So we would have to take our numbers from the second column here and you can see that we'd have to take two reduced tensile specimens and four side bends. And those are the kinds of tests that we would have to take to qualify our welding procedure. That's the mechanical tests we would have to do on it. And I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason, okay? So bear that in mind. Now flip to page 1042. Typical welder qualification tests. Now let's take that same six inch schedule 80 pipe. If we were going to test a welder for that, well first of all if you look where it says positions under qualification tests, positions, come down and you'll see 6G. This is why we give a test in 6G. Go over to the right a little bit, it says positions qualified for all, 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 all. But if we're going to qualify a welder, then we don't take as many specimens when we're qualifying a welder. Um, look at uh, table 2812, top of page 1042, typical welder and welding operator qualifications, number of specimens. Find our 3 eighths of an inch to one inch, and side bends, you're going to take two to eight side bends. So for a procedure test, we took uh, two reduced section tensile pulls and four side bends. For a welder qualification, we would take just a four side bends. So it's different. You don't take as many specimens for a welder qualification as you do for a procedure qualification. And that should give you a heads up. Make a note someplace. 
you may see a question to the effect of which qualification requires more specimens, more test specimens. And your answer is going to be procedure. You have to take more specimens to qualify a procedure than you do to certify a welder. Okay. Now, let's see. Soundness tests. Okay, go to 1045. And it says groove weld soundness test. Well, these are all soundness tests because it's testing the soundness of the weld. Now, an x-ray is a soundness test because it can detect internal flaws. So keep that in mind that x-rays are also considered soundness tests. Bin testing, uh, nick break, and fillet weld break. Those are all soundness tests. Now you notice they don't have tinsel up here. Tinsel is not a soundness test, but these are soundness tests. So make sure you make, make a note of that. Bin testing, nick break, and fillet break. Those are soundness tests. This is a, a tinsel testing machine a little fancier than the one we have, but, but it, it has a gauge and it has the, it has the, uh, the puller here. Examples of bin tests, uh, I'm not going to dwell on that because everybody knows what those are. Um, bin test pr procedure, you're going to prepare the sample, set the jig, bin the sample, and note, note here, the weld and the heat affected zone has to be stressed. It's a requirement. And then you evaluate the bin to a code, whether it's AWSD 1.1, ASME Section 9, API 1104, or some other. You still have to qualify it, uh, uh, check it in accordance with those acceptance standards. Nick break. This is on page 1047. It talks about nick breaks. And what you do in a nick break, this is, this is API 1104. You're going to score a specimen with a hacksaw, and then you're going to pull it apart. And here's one that's been pulled apart. And then you're actually going to inspect the edge. You're going to look at the weld metal and make sure there's no discontinuities in it. And you'd be surprised how often this fails a welder. I probably fail welders more on this than on any other test I give. Uh, fillet weld brake test. Let's see. Go to page 1051, fillet weld brake tests. On that, you're going to prepare the sample, break the sample, and evaluate the fracture. Well, here's, this is the standard AWS D1.1 fillet weld test. You, it's done on half inch thick plate. The specimens are eight inches long. You're going to make that weld with starts and stops in the middle here. And I think you may have a picture of this in your text. Yeah, on page 1044, Figure 2865 is this same picture. 1044, figure 2865, it's the same picture. And we do this in accordance with D11 code. And once the weld is done, we evaluate the, the weldment to see if you met all the standards, all, all the acceptance standards. If it's OK, then we're going to cut an inch off of each piece. And we'll perform a macro etch examination on, that, uh, on one of those pieces. Typically, we'll only use one piece. Some companies would do two. And what we'll do is we'll polish up the surface of the weld, and then we'll etch it with acid. And that will bring out in relief how far to the base metal uh, you fused and whether or not there's any defects in there. So that's one test we'll, we'll do on that. Now, the other test we're going to do is the break test. And the code doesn't specify how you're going to break the specimen, only that you do. Uh, We'll typically uh, put it in a vise and use a, use a sledgehammer, and, and I generally have the person that took the test break it. And once it's broke, then we're going to examine the fracture. We're going to look along here, and we're looking for areas of lack of fusion, porosity, uh, and slag inclusions. And these are go, no-go tests. They're either acceptable or they're not. And let's see, Sharpie tests. Turn to page 1053 where it says impact testing. Uh, these, this is a Sharpie test specimen. Uh, this is a plate that's been prepared. What they're going to do, they, they put a notch in it, and then they, they put it in a testing machine. And it's set here, and you can see they have a pendulum hammer. And what happens is this hammer swings down, and it strikes, strikes our specimen. And because it's been notched, it'll break. 
and they, they will th then analyze the fracture. Now, they, here's something important. They do these in sets of three, and they do them at different temperatures. So they might do a specimen, they might do one specimen, break it at minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. They might do the other one at, at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And they might do the, do the last one at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, just to see how the material is going to react at different temperatures. So those are some important things to note under impact testing. Now, uh, I, I haven't highlighted in anything here um, because I'm trying to hurry up and, and get through this. So read about that, read about those points. If you need to, play this little section of this tape over again uh, so that you know what we're going to be looking for. So you, uh, you might want to write this off in the column of your book. Prepare notched specimens in sets of three. Test each specimen at a specific temperature. You're going to impact the sample and then plot the results. That's all Sharpie testing. Okay, that's the last of my slides. But now let's uh, quickly, in, in your text, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Fatigue testing. There's a, such a thing called an endurance limit. If I take a piece of wire and I flex it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, after so long, that piece of wire is going to snap in two. I've exceeded its endurance limit. That's a term you should know, endurance limit. So in fatigue testing, they're going to try to determine a material's endurance limit. And they're going to subject it to stress. Uh, they, might, they might put it in a vise and, and, and rapidly move it back and forth a million times until failure. If it doesn't fail, then they know where its endurance limit is and it will never fail unless they go beyond that, that stress. So that's how they do fatigue testing. Corrosion testing, um, sometimes there's going to be some stuff uh, subjected to corrosive environments and so they will do corrosion testing to see how well the material, particularly stainless steel, Inconel, some of the alloy materials will stand up to corrosion. And then there's specific gravity. You're not going to get any questions on specific gravity. Um, then we come to visual inspection. And here I'm going to go through this rather quickly because uh, you should already be familiar with this, but you are liable to get questions concerning this on your test. Know what incomplete penetration is. Uh, as long as you've been taking classes and as much as I've been working with you, you should understand what incomplete fu uh, penetration is. Incomplete fusion now, slightly different. Read about incomplete fusion, know what that is. Undercutting, know what that is. Some or all of these terms will be on your test. Inclusions, slag inclusions, tungsten inclusions, two types of inclusions. Know both of those. On page 1059, porosity. By now, you should certainly understand what porosity is. Cracking. Something I want you to know about cracking, cracking is considered to be the most severe defect. Most severe. You may get a question asking you which of these discontinuities is most severe. Is it porosity? Is it inclusions? Is it cracking? Your answer, of course, would be cracking. Um, weld metal cracking, base metal cracking, there's a lot of different cracks. Uh, read about those. Get a feel for those. Um, there's transverse cracks. There's longitudinal cracks. There's heat affected zone cracks. There's underbead cracks. There's cold cracks. There's hot cracks. Your book doesn't go into it that depth but I want you to know something about it, so read that over. And also know, here's two things you should, you should plot, write down, is what makes a crack so, so severe is its end condition. Okay? Its end condition. If it has a sharp point, sharp point end condition, it can propagate, it can grow. That's the thing that makes cracks so, so bad. It's in condition, uh, and the fact that it's linear in nature. Um, dimensional defects, not much about that. I'm not going to ask any questions on that. Weld gauges, this is a typical weld inspection kit. You can buy this for about $125 from the American Welding Society. Uh, it's a nice kit, nice to have around. If you take my inspection class, those of you that are going for the degree or somebody that just wants to know this stuff better, uh, I'll teach you how to use all of these. But here we have, uh, your book talks about this particular gauge uh, that we use to determine uh, 
a variety of, uh, of information. Uh, most commonly, we'll check uh, root reinforcement or well reinforcement with this one. Uh, fillet weld gauges, we use these to check, to check fillet welds. Fillet welds have to be at a particular, a particular size. If what you're working to says, we want a, we want a, um, a fillet weld with a quarter inch throat and a three eighths inch leg, then you're going to use these kind of, kind of gauges to determine that. This one here where it's kind of got a little double notch, that's what you use to check the throat of a weld. So if I have a, if I have a fillet, fillet weld here, I'm going to lay this gauge down and slide it in, and, it will, and if it touches or not, I can tell how thick that throat is. On the other side, if I wanted to check the leg, then we would take and we put the other side in, and if it touches or not, I can tell what the leg is. So you have to know the terminology and you have to know how to use these gauges. Again, you'll learn that in, in my inspection class. And then this one here, this is pretty good to give you an idea of how much undercut something has. And that's what I mostly use it for, but it has some other uses. So again, read these over briefly because you may get a question or two on that. Um, and that's about it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me and any of the stuff that, that you felt we didn't cover sufficiently. Get with me and I'd be happy. I love to talk about this stuff. So I'd be happy to talk, to talk with you some more about it. But I would encourage all of you to take my inspection class. That's Weld 2670. Uh, even if you don't go on to be a certified welding inspector, you're still going to get a nice little document saying that you had 60 hours of training in that class if you happen to take it. Thank you for your attention and uh, have a good day.